Your favorite PGA and LPGA legends, pros and top instructors are right here every week on Next on the Tee. Join Chris as the greats of the game share their stories, insights and playing lessons. Now, back to Chris and more of the show. All right, now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Mr. Bobby Nichols. Let me give you some more background on Mr. Nichols. He is from Louisville, Kentucky, played his college golf at Texas A&M, where he won the Southwest Conference Individual Championship in 1952. He was a Southwest Conference medalist in 1956 and team co-captain in 1958. He joined the PGA Tour in 1960. He won 12 times on the regular tour, including the 1964 PGA Championship, won three more times out on the Champions Tour. In 2014, he was honored as a hometown champion by the city of Louisville when Valhalla hosted the PGA Championship that year. And I am both honored and privileged to have him back with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Good evening, Mr. Nichols. Thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the invite. So, Mr. Nichols, for those who haven't joined us the past couple of times you've been on the show, you started out caddying at age nine. And I recently had the, had the privilege of having Caddy Hall of Famer Dennis Cohn join me here on the show, and he is working on a program to get caddies back in golf courses around the country. So caddy programs going in different courses all across the country, which to me is a great way to introduce more young players in the game. How important was it for you when you started caddying? How much did that develop your love for the game of golf? It did everything, really, Chris. I started caddying when I was nine years old. It was 1945, and I caddied there until 1950 at Audubon Country Club there in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, back then, the celebrities were, I got this caddy for uh, Pee Wee Reese. I was his personal caddy when he came home from the season with the Brooklyn Dodgers <clears throat> and uh he was quite a golfer, and I all those years of caddy, and it really taught you how to swing the golf club just by just by watching and being around and know what to do at a golf course and learn the mannerisms and the things and do's and don'ts of, of a of a playing the golf and things. It was really it was special. You just you just don't you just don't. It's hard to teach that. You have to learn it by being actually in, involved. So for kids, you know, to get more more junior golfers interested in the game and to, you know, really kind of, you know, get them there and keep them there. Was that was being a caddy and being around the game of golf was was, was that the thing that kind of sucked you in and said, "You know what? I want to be a part of this game for life?" That's absolutely. Plus it's uh, you know, it's just a great uh, atmosphere to be around and, and you're around guys that got go, uh, rather caddies that they're working for the same as you are and it's just a, a great uh, relationship that you have and normally at a golf club you're it's almost like a you have a, a the members are going to look out for the caddies and, and take care of them and, and very rarely do they ever get into trouble on a golf course so it's just a it's almost like a built-in babysitter for the family where you can stay there all day long in the caddy and, and just hang around the golf. and It's just a lot of fun just to be associated with something like that. I, I love it. How much did it impact you when you later on when you you know became a pro and you were out playing on tour for things like you know knowing how to read a green, knowing, knowing distances and yardages and things of that nature? How much did the caddy piece you know, help you learn all of those things and maybe give you a leg up when you went out and uh, out on tour? Well, I, I think just being around it and watching it and looking at it and watching other players and, or the, and the people that you're caddying for and playing with different individuals, that's how you learn. And I I didn't have too many of, uh, lessons at early age. And I, I'm not like, or rather I am like most every every other player my age. We learn by just by being around the players, the good players, and the medium players, or whatever, and just being able to watch and learn from that respect. And also, when you're caddying, there people are reading greens and learning. You're learning how to do that and so forth. It was a it was a great education. There's no other way you could teach it other than actually being involved. And, and speaking of your swing, how did you develop that? Who 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 did you learn it from? Who did who did you emulate? Were there somebody or some you know somebody that influenced you in developing your golf swing? I think when I first uh, played as an amateur, you just kind of I looked at a couple or, or, or more than a couple people that I wanted to swing like, and it just came pretty much uh, natural, you might say it. And then 
When I got on the tour, I played a lot of golf with Dr. Millicall for the early 60s and Mr. Hogan and a few others. And But my swing was pretty well fixed by then. I guess you could say a few tweaks here and there. But, uh, you know, when you, once you get on the tour, I don't think you change your swing any. You, you might change a few things that might do you some good, like your maybe your grip or, or the uh, stance and a few things. But nothing major. It's pretty well about your uh, natural ability that you've developed all through the years for playing uh, amateur golf in uh and the things that you learn naturally, and then you just pick up a few of the thinking uh, items that uh, all the players that played the tour and, and the people that you idolized growing up and watching, and that's how you learn. Just what by most of the time, just by watching and, and listening to what they have to tell you. Back in those days, all the players, uh, the, the premier players, were very cordial and trying to help each and every one of you when you were starting the tour. It was really a neat situation, and I, I, I now it was a really not really special for me and all the other guys that started to do to be on the tour and have the people that we idolized and watched all our years as an amateur and watch them and being able to be with them and they're and they're willing to help your help your game in any way shape or form Mr. Nichols, you are you are a powerful golfer. I read a comparison that said back in the day you were you were John Daly long at that time. How far were you driving the golf ball back in the in your prime? I, I think Jack was probably the longest, uh, the, the probably certainly the most accurate, you might say, as, a, as an average. And uh, there were a few of us. There were about a handful that could, could hit it. But today's uh, it, it's quite a bit different. That's, I'm laughing because I, to be compared to the hitters today is it's no comparison because I think our longest hitters was anywhere from 275 to 280 and uh, most of the lady golfers hit it that far today so it's amazing how much better and how much further the players are hitting it today it's just incredible it's just almost mind boggling to see how far they really can hit it and I watch them all and it's just uh, it never ceases to amaze me Mr. Nichols, I want to, you know, go go back to your wire to wire win at the 64 PGA Championship at uh, Columbus Country Club there in Columbus, Ohio, and you opened with a round of 64. Like I mentioned in your intro, the first time anyone had ever shot 64 in a PGA Championship, and in fact, your 271 total was a record that stood for 30 years. Take us back there. What what got you off to such a hot start? Well, I don't really know. I was playing with Gardner Dickinson, who. Uh playing the practice round here and Mr. Hogan and I wasn't too and doing too well. I was not hitting the ball at all, but I was listening to what they had to tell me and I was trying to do a few things they were saying. They weren't really trying to change your swing. I was just trying to listen to what they had to say and, and I don't know, it just all kinda of clicked the next day when I started making putts. I think it's it's true almost any time you're playing in a golf tournament if the putts start falling, uh your swing and everything else starts getting more uh, better, and everything kind of falls into place, and and you just uh, that's how you shoot the lower rounds. Which you, it'd be, be nice if you could keep that attitude and that feeling all through every tournament, but that's uh, it's hard to do. But there's a lot of great players out there that, that are getting close to doing that. And Mr. Nichols, you, you took a one-stroke lead over Arnold Palmer going into the final round in, in 1964 was right there in the prime of his career. You had Jack Nicholas and Mr. Hogan tied for fifth. So a lot of big names right there at the top of that leaderboard. Did, were you feeling the pressure of those guys going into that final round? What was it like sleeping on the lead knowing you had those guys right behind you? Well, I think it's uh, you learn that from experience by playing and getting yourself in that position. And the only thing I can tell you is that, that the only way to learn is to, to put yourself in that position and you just kind of go from there and you learn. And, and uh, first thing you know, uh, things start clicking for you. But uh, as far as trying to teach somebody what to do in a situation like that, you almost have to, like I say, do it, get in a position to, to do it yourself. You've got to have the experience. And, and So how did the press treat you going into that final round? Were they all about you or were they more focused on those other three guys? How'd they treat you? Well, I, I, I don't, I didn't really look at the papers. I tell you the truth that during that before, before they, uh, during the tournament, because I was focused on what I was trying to do. It's pretty obvious that the, that the press, uh, you know, with Jack and Arnold and Mr. Hogan, who he was, uh, or, or the time. And so they were all, they were probably, uh, 
more focused on them as far as trying to say something about them and whatever. But uh, they were very kind to me. I was very, they were very good to me. I had no problem at all with the press. They were uh, very, very supportive. And uh, I have no complaints at all. How about the galleries? I imagine you're trying to win your first major and you're practically doing it or attempting to do it in Jack Nicholas's backyard in Columbus, Ohio. What were, what were the galleries like and uh, how did you feel about walking around in that last round? Well, actually, in being in Columbus and being born and raised in Louisville, which was a couple hundred miles south, uh, there was a lot of people that I knew was in the gallery and also uh, – with Mr. Hogan there and Jack and Arnold, you got all the names of everyone connected with the, the super players. So everybody came out to watch the tournament. It was enormous crowds. It was the biggest crowd, I believe, the PGA has ever had up until that time. And I think Jack was talking to a group a little after that, but maybe a six months or so, a year or so, and, and he got the idea to build Muirfield there in Columbus. He said, what gave him the idea was after he played, uh, watched the tremendous crowds at the Columbus Country Club, he says, this town needs another tournament, I mean, another golf course, because the crowds were this enormous. So uh, that was a big plus, and like I say, the crowds were wonderful, and they were very good to, to everybody. And Mr. Nichols, you've mentioned some of the great players that you've had a chance to play alongside of, you know, Hogan and Nicholas and, and Palmer and yeah. Dr. Middlecoff and Snead and all of those guys. Who who are some of the guys that you really enjoyed playing practice rounds with or really just hanging out after, you know, after the round or after a tournament? Oh, there's – we uh, – I like I say, I played with Mr. Hogan about a dozen times and different – and. Uh, Won a couple of tournaments with him, and uh, besides 64, won the World Open with him at Oakland Hills. But uh, uh, we also got to play with guys like Colin Boat and Jackie Burke and Jimmy DeMarit. I mean, I, I could just go on forever. The people were very, I mean, the players were very receptive and taking us, let us join them. Sam Sneed, he, any of them. Uh, I always try to get in their way when they get ready to play to make sure they saw me and they can either say get out of the way or come on and join us that sort of thing I kind of made myself available with a lot of different ones and I think a lot of players did that because you can learn something from them sometimes it may cost you a lot of money but what the heck <laughs> you won the uh, 1962 St. Petersburg Open playing with Dr. Kerry Middlecoff and I, and I read that you credited him with helping you out a great deal over the course of your career. What role did he play with you? Well, he he just uh, he kind of took a liking to me. Every time I went to the Masters, he'd always play with me and, and teach me where or tell me where to hit the drives and hit the shots and things like that. And, and uh, he was extremely helpful. He, he was just, uh, you know, he, he was such a great player. I admired watching him in the 50s when I thought he was the him and Sam were two of the longest hitters of the game. I thought Doc Milikoff from 54, 5, and 6 was probably the longest and straightest of any of any player out there on the PGA Tour. And like I say, he took a lot. I don't know where I took a liking to him. I just kind of got in his way, and he finally got tired of it and said, come on, play. And I, I joined him and played with him. And, and uh, it was just fun. Tommy Bolt was the same way. I mean, those guys were just tremendous. I, uh, we, uh, I think that it does, I guess, well, today's, today's players are so daggone many of them. Uh, they don't have that kind of a report that they, almost any player on the tour. Now, you can name 30 or 40 of them could win any week out there on the tour. They're so good. There's so many of them, and the money's so good. So you got so many more players trying to play the game, and, and there's a lot. Uh, you got tournaments going. You and the city don't play the regular tour. You got mini tours and all kinds of things that you can participate, compete against, to pre compete in, and everything. So it's been wonderful golf. Golf's been tremendous. And Mr. Nichols, you played in the 1967 Ryder Cup matches at Champions Golf Club in Houston. Right. Were Were the Ryder Cup matches back then like we see them today? It's, it, today it seems like it's it's a you know it, it's a very intense match. It seems very stressful for the players. Was it that way back in in '67? Was or was it more of an exhibition like the you know the, um, the I think the original idea of the Ryder Cup was supposed to be about? 
Well, the press has probably taken it to another level here This in this day and time. And back then, it was kind of a special because you're playing for your country. So I put more uh, pressure on it as an individual when you're playing the Ryder Cup. Not only you, you want to win, but you have that feeling of you're playing for your country, which is really, really special. And our captain was Mr. Hogan, so that made it even more special. And, and uh, any time you play in the Ryder Cup, you had that feeling that you got to you're playing for your country, and you want to do you want to do as good as you can. And you and Johnny Potts were paired together, and you won all right. of your matches. Plus, you earned a point and a half in your singles matches as well. That's a that's a heck of a rookie Ryder Cup uh, debut. Yeah, we won by the biggest margin ever back in that day, '67. And I think a lot of we can credit to Mr. Hogan by he was such a tremendous asset. And this, just having him leading us, kind of, you might say, and he, he paired us and he would ask us what, who we wanted to play with. And he was very accommodating. He didn't try to change us or try to say, well, so and so you this way. You, if he said, if, so with Johnny and I, we had played a lot of golf together because we were both about the same age. And, uh, so uh, it was just a, a perfect marriage. And we uh, got along well. We played good together. So he said, you guys can play together. And that's why you pretty well let everybody play. He let the guys themselves choose. And then if he didn't really, uh, he didn't, dis- I don't know if he disagrees. I don't know. I didn't hear every every pairing. But I, I, I would think he let most of the guys play with whomever they felt the best with. And that's the only way you do it today, too. But you have a few other things that, that take consideration. You won the 1973 uh, Westchester Classic. And when I was looking over, you know, that, that tournament results, you saw it 16 under par for the tournament. And Westchester was a big stop on the tour at the yeah. time. Westchester Country Club had a lot of celebrity members back in the day. What do you remember about winning that golf tournament? That was great because I played with Mr. Hogan practice round there. It was really something out, out. Uh, stuck with them. But prior to the Westchester, they had a tournament in 19... The Westchester was 70, 1973. In 1970, they had a tournament called the Dow Jones in Upper Montclair in New Jersey. It was the first $300,000 tournament on the tour. And uh, I was fortunate enough to win that, but uh, then I get this letter and it's from Augusta and Bobby Jones. And inside the letter, it had a clipping it is. It had a picture of me winning, but it also at the byline it says Bobby Jones wins Dow Jones. So <laughs> I get this letter from Mister Jones. He said, "Dear Bobby, sorry about the misidentification, but you received a check. Continued success, Bobby Jones." And he signed it as 1970, and uh, that was quite special to have something like that. That came out of the blue. I mean, who? Did, you know, get a, a letter like that from them, one of the best ever. No Certainly doubt. Most, um, yeah. You best played ever. on the uh, Champions Tour for several years, starting uh-huh. back in 1986, and actually won more money on that tour than you did on the regular tour. That's, that's, what was that's what, right. what did it mean for you to be able to have like a second life when the when the senior tour started out? Well, we all were very we were, all were very fortunate, and we we couldn't believe what we were seeing and. We just couldn't wait to get out there and play. And we, we played pro-ams and tournaments on the senior tour. And like you say, we played for more money, way more money than we ever did on the regular tour. So it was it was a, like a bogey, I guess you'd call it. And uh, <laughs> we were forced and we got a little extra. But anyways, it was uh, it was quite nice. It really was. And we, we got to be back the old guys, too. They came out and played, like Julius Boros, Art Wall, Dave Roberto Davidson, so we had Bobby Bob Toski, uh, Terry Milkoff, of course, all of them played, and it was kind of a, a re- reunion, and we, it was, we were lucky to be part of it, so we were, we were in awe. 1989, you win the Southwestern Bell Classic. The win came 15 years after the last time that you had won on the regular tour. What did it feel like for you to get back in the winner's circle? It was fun. It was uh, uh, you know, we're, like I say, we're most of just playing for the fun and have a camaraderie and be with guys on the tour. We got and have a lot of fun. It, wasn't, it really wasn't a lot to play for, but it was more than we had played for in the past. So it was, it was nice. And uh, 
So we we all had a lot of fun. We if, if we get through playing golf, we didn't go out and hit golf balls or practice or that sort of thing. We'd usually stick around the golf shop and uh, have a few beers and we listen to our friend Gabe Brewer tell jokes and things that we all got together, had a big time, some laughter, and we did the same thing with the members. So they they really enjoyed us, and uh, we enjoyed them. And the, the tour kind of, well, it is today is tremendous. It's really done well. So it it was, uh, but it started off kind of slow, but with uh, Sam and Julius and Doc Middlecoff and Tommy Boat and Art Wall and Roberto and Gabriel and all of them, they just they played. Bob Goby and they all played, so it made the tour. Uh, what it is today. Mr. Nichols, just a couple more before we let you go. And you were recognized as a hometown hero when the PGA Championship was played at Valhalla back in, in 2014. What was it like being honored that way by uh, the people of Louisville? It was quite special and, and very unexpected. I didn't have any idea that was gonna happen, what that was happening. And then when it did happen, I was totally surprised. And like I say, honored and, and uh you know, I, being uh, growing up there and then have the um, National PGA to be played there was even more so special. And the town uh, has really gotten into golf and, and the golf tournaments. And, of course, with Justin Thomas being from there, he's he's the new king in the world, I would say, with the way he's playing and the way he's going to be playing from now on. He's, he's a tremendous uh, player. He really is. He's uh, definitely one of the best in, in uh it looks like he got a golf swing in life forever. And uh, very proud of him, and it's, it's nice to see it. And the, uh, well, all, everything about the PGA, and of all things, his first major was the PGA, and he won in uh, Squill Hollow in Charlotte this past year. And so uh, that was quite a, quite a, quite a nice thing. Happy for him. Especially. You have a golf course named in your honor. There, right? What's yeah. what's what's your involvement with the I, Bobby Nichols Golf Course? Well, I don't have any involvement with it. I was done by the, the city of Louisville back when I won the uh, PGA of 64, and they put my name on it, but I don't have any connection with it other than it's run by the city and owned by the city. And it's, uh, pretty, it's, uh, it's pretty accurate. I mean, it's pretty uh, fairly nice. I go by there. I've been around three or four different times, and uh, – I haven't played the played there lately, but uh, it's nice. It's a nice honor. So that begs the question: How's your golf game? I don't have one. <laughs> I know I'm. <laughs> my legs are giving out on me. I'm just. Uh, I'd rather watch than try to play. It's just. Uh, I got a body that's been hammered pretty good throughout the years, from time to time, and. And, uh, you know, I think we all, I don't know if you do, Chris, but get arthritis gets sets in. It's, uh, pretty hard to play. It's, it's, uh, I remember watching Sam play, uh, hitting the balls off the first tee during the Masters and how his swing got shorter and shorter and he could barely swing. I said, my goodness, uh, one of the best swingers of all time. I thought, well, I guess I have to look forward to that. I hope, well, on the other hand, it's better than the alternative, that's for sure. So, yes, anyways, yes. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, feel like playing a whole lot, really. It's just, uh, I go out and watch, watch, I'd, I'd rather watch people play. Well, Mr. Nichols, it has been an incredible honor having you back on the show. I hope you'll continue to come back from time to time, share more of your stories and memories with us, because uh, it's always such an honor and a delight to have you as part of the show. All you have to do is ask me, Chris. I'll be back. Thank you. I appreciate it very much, Mr. Nichols. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to catching up with you next time. Okay. Thank you. Take care. That is the great Bobby Nichols, again, won the 1964 PGA Championship 12 times out on the regular tour, another three more times on the Champions Tour, and uh, just an incredible gentleman. I can't wait to have him back on the show again. Hopefully, I get that opportunity again real soon.